opportunity to uh, talk at the TEDx conference. This is a very nice photo. I was about five kilos less than I am now. Uh, okay, um, as you can see in the, in the front, there's a time timer. I shall use one of these here. Um, and I was told 18 minutes. Okay. Do I get a lightsaber as well? Yeah, there's one. Okay. Social entrepreneurship. No. So the, the talk is, is there a title page to this as well? No, there isn't. Okay, the talk is human-centered design or how design thinking will put me out of a job. Social entrepreneurship is what I research and teach at this university. Social entrepreneurship, let's, I won't go into it. There are many, many TED Talks on social entrepreneurship. I Googled it yesterday. There's about uh, 12. It says the 12 best talks on social entrepreneurship. You can imagine there's many more. But social entrepreneurship is basically about social entrepreneurs. Yeah. That solve social problems using something called social innovation. I'll tell you about that in a minute. What I do as a social scientist, lots of social here, what I do as a social scientist is I try and analyze these and make sense of them. And because I'm a social scientist, I make sense of them of the phenomena associated with social entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurs solving social problems using social innovation, with a view to improving this, with a view to making practice of social entrepreneurship better because that's what we social scientists do. Well, what is social entrepreneurship? There's a simple definition by someone called Jeff Mulgan. Basically, social innovation are new ideas that work. But what does that mean? Essentially, that means that social innovations find ways of meeting social needs and solving social problems that have not been met up to now. Examples, the, the classic example is microcredits by someone called uh, uh, Mohammed Yunus on the Grameen Bank. He's a um, Nobel Prize winner. Another example would be, um, a German example would be helping children of immigrant families keep up at school. Yeah, coaching, coaching uh, progress. But a lot of people say that social entrepreneurship Oops. Oh, hey. Oh. Obviously not a, not a professor of computer science. Social entrepreneurship is all about repairing um, or patching up social problems, stuff that's broken. Social entrepreneurs come and they patch up, they make better, they ameliorate, they mitigate problems. And that, of course, begs the question, when it makes, I mean, have you ever tried fixing one of them? The glass is never the same again and you can't really use it. So wouldn't it make, it begs the question, wouldn't it make more sense to um, avoid breaking the glass in the first place? But in order to do that, I've got to tell you a little bit about conventional ways of creating value in capitalist society. Oh, did I say capitalist? Yeah, can't say capitalist. Uh, in, in market economies, <laughs> which aren't capitalist. Conventional ways of creating value. This goes back to a, a Scottish moral philosopher, some of you may have heard of him, called Adam Smith of the 18th century. And Adam Smith argued that, oh yeah, he argued that creating something like this, yum, or for the vegans in the room, something like this, entails this, a big mess. But that's okay, said Adam Smith, because we create enough value, we make enough money of creating these scrumptious dishes that we can pay a specialist to clean that up efficiently and effectively, far more efficiently and effectively than we could do ourselves. Everyone gains. It's called the invisible hand, it's called the market. But things aren't quite that easy because creating something, making these here, ugly shirts, the only ones I found, may entail something like this. That boy is about, what, 12? Or making these, teak furniture, very nice, 
entails this. And for those of you that can't recognize, that's Thailand, deforestation of the rainforest in Thailand. So, some messes obviously aren't so easy to clean up. And there's a, I, I, I presume there's a biological or uh, there's, a, there's a predominance of bi biological types. No, we're all biological types. <laughs> um, scientists in the life sciences here, once biodiversity, once uh, a species is extinct, it's very, very difficult to, to make up for that on the one hand. And the boy may be here. The boy here may be creating value, but he's certainly creating damage to himself in terms of uh, education foregone. Good. So people argue when it makes sense to avoid that. And amongst social entrepreneurs, the holy grail of, uh, of social entrepreneurship is something called blended value. It's something called, can we make do business? Can we create value that at the same time doesn't create a mess? Doesn't mean that kids in, in South Asia don't get, a, uh, um, don't get an education. That biodiversity is degraded irretrievably. Well, there's lots of theory about this. And one thing in practice that would help us do this is, drum roll, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> human-centered design. But what is human-centered design? <laughs> That's obviously a, a case of human-centered design that went wrong. Um, human-centered design describes a whole set of practices, at the heart of which is that Humans, users, people, are at the center of what we make, are at the center of the, the solutions we create, of the products and service that we create. Now, there's many ways to do this. Some of them range from including the user in the design process, that's called co-creation, to others where you have design teams go out and create empathy with the user, that's sort of called design thinking. And I'll tell you a little bit more about design thinking here, because that's what we do here at Jacobs. It's, uh, this was a, 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 um, a method developed in, um, developed in Stanford at, at a design bureau called IDEO and at Stanford University. What does human-centered design or design thinking do? Well, it's something I call a genius hack. If you look at the genius entrepreneurs of this world, Steve Jobs, Mohammed Yunus, uh, uh, Richard Branson, etc. It seems that these people manage to take a whole load of ideas from different disciplines and integrate it in their head, a little bit like that, that graphic does. It's very difficult for us mere mortals to do that. Yeah? And what we mere mortals must do is we must get together people from different disciplines, social scientists like myself, uh, life scientists like most of the room here, um, most people in the room here, uh, physicists, etc., computer scientists, but also people like artists and people like designers. And we must leverage the, the, the synergies that you could possibly get out of that. And one way of doing that is human-centered design processes. And the, what, what we do here at Jakobs, what we actually do two floors up in the D-Forge upstairs from which this this couch was taken, is we use transdisciplinary, it's three elements that we use, transdisciplinary teams, um, variable workspace, that's in fact a photo from two, two floors up, and a design thinking process. This is the design thinking process that was developed at Stanford, we use that one here. Multidisciplinary teams, well, here at Jakobs we have lots of different disciplines and people from all over uh, the world, and that creates lots of friction and energies, and I try and put teams together that are particularly, particularly uh, diverse and where there's a lot of friction and tension. And I can see some of my students here smiling from last year's friction and tension. Um, and uh, multidisciplinary teams is one. Variable workspaces is another. Of course, all of us go to the office into our little cubicle and we have things the way they, they, they've always been, but not in design thinking. In design thinking, it's all about trying to adapt the workspace to the needs of the team at the moment. So if you have a look here, everything's on, on wheels. Everything's on wheels and someone's put the brakes on. Um, 
Vorführeffekt, as we Germans say. Um, everything's on wheels, so you can move it around. You can use the workspaces. You can you can actually create. Um, you can create, uh, uh, recreate experiences for users to test. But the most important thing here is a human-centered design process. Now, I won't go into detail here, especially because you can't really see. It's a six-staged design thinking revolves around a six-staged design process. Um, what is important to hear is that this process combines social science or qualitative social science and engineering and natural sciences. In the phase of the qualitative social sciences, we go out and we use methods like ethnography, uh, participant observation, to try and build empathy with users, try and build empathy with stakeholders, try and go out and engage stakeholders, talk to them. What's it like being in your situation? Try to walk a mile in the shoes. I think that's always a slightly unpleasant metaphor. Um, try and walk a mile in the shoes of the other guy. Try and experience what users in particular um, uh, situations experience. What we did once here is we got people from Apetito, which is our caterer here on campus, and we gave them wheelchairs and crutches and gave them eye, eye blinds and we made them or we encouraged them to walk through the serveries which is where we serve food here um, to see what it's like uh, to see what it's like if, if what the barriers are like and this was an eye-opener for them so the first part is all about creating empathy with users with stakeholders and on the basis of that empathy of getting close and understanding what the real needs of people are in this situation. We switch over to the engineering and natural science and create new ideas that solve that problem. Well, human-centered designs, this is the flagship design. Um, whoa, yeah. these are flagship designs from IDEO and from Stanford. The top is, is called Embrace. Embrace is a, uh, as you know, children that are prematurely born need to be kept warm. They're kept warm in machines called incubators. Machines called incubators cost uh, tens of thousands of uh, US dollars and are not really available where they're needed in countries like Nepal. Now, a design team from Stanford University went to Nepal and went to the, so they went to Kathmandu and found out in Kathmandu, yeah, there's, in the hospital in Kathmandu, they have um, incubators, they work very well. But not all premature babies are born in Kathmandu. A lot of them are born in the, in the villages, in the mountains. So they went out there and they talked to the, um, talked to the, uh, uh, the mothers or expecting mothers or, or the families and found out what they need, what these families really need is they need something to keep the baby warm long enough so that it can be brought to the next um, incubator. Now this thing is a sleeping bag, as you can see. Can you see? Yep, it's a sleeping bag. Um, it's made from special material. It keeps a constant temperature for about four hours and then drops off, then you have to heat it up again. Cost, $300. Solves the problem goes right to the need, solves the problem. Down here is a shopping cart. You all know the shopping carts, the, the wire ones. Is there anything good you can say about them? No. So IDEO redesigned that here. You can actually see that on, on TV, on ABC. It's called the deep dive. So you, you see commercial products go along the needs and they all of a sudden they stop sort of being commercial products and they solve problems for people. But also this is done in the public sector, yeah? Over there is an example of the Danin, Danish, uh, uh, um, the Danish uh, design bureau. Well, it's, it's, it's part of the Danish government called Mind Lab, and they use design thinking and co-creation processes to solve public sector problems. So up there, they have a, uh, a digital mentor system that helps long-term unemployed come back into uh, back into the job market. And down here, the British Design Council has a number of projects using, again, needs finding, not necessarily design thinking, but human-centered design, to try and find out what, it's called Nihai Design Challenge, and they're trying to find out what the needs of children in 
um, depressed areas of the UK, like Southwark, which is southern, southern, um, southern London, what their needs are and how you can get the, 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 the um, services to these children rather than the other way around. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Well, if design can actually solve people's problems by understanding their needs, by iterating, by going out and trying new things out and actually bringing the stakeholders and the users in, we won't need social entrepreneurship because any type of entrepreneurship which is by definition fulfilling unmet needs will be geared towards fulfilling unmet needs. And I will be going to my nearest Arbeitsamt. Thank you very much.